Hi everyone, I'm Philip Boone, and this is a quick medical genetics lecture about congenital adrenal hyperplasia, or CAH. This is part two of a two video series, so if you haven't watched part one, I encourage you to do so. Part one was all about the most common variety of congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which is 21 hydroxylase deficiency. What this lecture will be on, on the other hand, is going through the rest of the types of CAH, comparing and contrasting them, and showing how they fit into the pathway of steroid hormone synthesis in the adrenal cortex of the adrenal gland. We're going to go over a couple additional um, concepts and definitions that got left out of the first lecture. Also left out of the first lecture is a differential diagnosis, uh, differential diagnosis of CAH, so we're going to go through that too. So let's get started. So what I want to do is go through for each of the different types of CAH and show you where the enzyme that's deficient is in this pathway of steroid hormone synthesis. We'll talk about what aldosterone levels are in that condition, what cortisol levels are, testosterone levels, who gets ambiguous genitalia, meaning 46XX individuals who, if they had no genetic disorder, would be female. Are they the ones that have ambiguous genitalia, meaning that they look more male-like than you'd expect? Or is it the 46XY individuals where, had they had no genetic disorder, would be male, but something about them is less male or more female-like? Finally, and I won't mention them specifically, for your reference, they're the gene listed for each of these enzyme deficiencies. So before we dive into this, let's remind ourselves about this pathway and what is it exactly that I'm depicting here. So this is the adrenal cortex. There's three layers from outside the zona glomerulosa. The middle layer, zona fasciculata. Zona reticularis is the innermost one. And then the adrenal medulla would be in here at the very center of the adrenal gland. Each of these layers is charged with a different task. This one making aldosterone, this one making cortisol, this one making testosterone. So one steroid hormone per layer of the cortex. It all starts with cholesterol, and you can follow the arrows that they generally go downward and rightward, meaning that if there's a blockade in any of these steps, meaning that there's an enzyme that gets mutated and uh, produced incorrectly or not produced, that things tend to build up this direction or go around the blockade. And we saw that with 21 hydroxylase deficiency. So let's jump into that, not only to remind ourselves what that was, but just to see how our logic in this lecture is going to work. So with 21 hydroxylase deficiency, do you remember from the last lecture which of these steps requires that enzyme? So it is going to be right here and right here, and I'll write it in. Abbreviated 21 hydroxylase and 21 hydroxylase here. In this case, you had blockades leading to aldosterone and cortisol, so things backed up. You had high 17-hydroxyprogesterone, then you get high androstenedione, and it roots to testosterone. So testosterone was high, aldosterone and cortisol were low, and we'll write that here. Low aldosterone, low cortisol, high testosterone. What's the phenotypic result of this? Well, this was salt wasting, hypotension, adrenal crises. Cortisol being low, an individual was not able to mobilize sugar in times of stress, part of the adrenal crisis. And for testosterone, this led to ambiguous genitalia. And in this case, it was ambiguous genitalia in 46XX individuals. Too much testosterone virilized the genitalia of these individuals who otherwise would have been phenotypically female. So that logic, now we'll go through for the rest of the disorders. So 11 beta hydroxylase deficiency. This one's pretty similar to 21 hydroxylase deficiency, which is why I put it next. And the place that it goes is right here, two places. 11 beta hydroxylase there. And 11 beta hydroxylase here. So again, we don't get aldosterone. We don't get cortisol. Each of these are gonna be low. But a little bit different in the case of aldosterone, we don't have so much of that, but we do have a lot of 11-deoxycorticosterone, or DOC. So I'm going to write high DOC here, because DOC is also, like aldosterone, a mineralocorticoid. So rather than having uh, hypotension and salt wasting, 
In 11 beta hydroxylase deficiency, we actually get hypertension from too much DOC. So you retain salt and get hypertension. So a little bit different, and it would trick you up if all you knew was the aldosterone level. With cortisol, that being low, failure to mobilize sugar in times of stress. Now how about testosterone? So there's no problem with this pathway. And indeed, we get rooting to too much testosterone, leading to individuals who are 46XX having virilized or more male-like genitalia than they otherwise would had they not had this disorder. Let's move on to the next one, 3-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase deficiency. Where's that enzyme? Let me put it in the pathway. Goes there, here, and here. So three places all along the top. So in this case, we get a failure to make aldosterone. So aldosterone is low. We get a failure to make cortisol. So cortisol is low. And for testosterone, we have an interesting thing that happens, which is that in females, it's generally normal. And in males, it's low. Now, why does it happen? So DHEA can get peripherally converted. So there's a little bit that kind of leaks through. And it turns out that for females, that's sufficient. But for males, it's not enough testosterone being made, hence the difference. And in terms of who has uh, ambiguous genitalia or genitalia that are a little bit different, in this case, because males have low testosterone, but females don't have particularly high testosterone, we have the 46 XYs that look a little bit different than they otherwise would. And this would be an incompletely virilized male, for example, having a micropenis, um, perineal hypospadias, bifid scrotum, a blind vaginal pouch, or other abnormalities that would make this individual's genitalia more female-like or incompletely male-like than you'd expect. Next disorder. This is actually two disorders, and I put them in the same uh, row for the following reason. So one of them is 17-alpha-hydroxylase, the other one 17-20-lyase. And before I tell you why they're in the same row, let me put them on our chart. So 17-hydroxylase goes there, and 17-hydroxylase goes here. 17-20-lyase goes there, and 17-20-lyase also goes here. The reason that they're in the same row is that they're actually encoded by the same enzyme. So this is one enzyme that comes from one gene that has two different functionalities. You can have mutations that affect only the 17-alpha-hydroxylase activity, you can have mutations that affect the 1720 lyase activity only, or you can have mutations that affect both. And we'll go through, and it's pretty similar in these three categories with one difference, and I'll tell you what that is when we go there, depending on which of these functionalities doesn't work. So in both cases, there's a blockade uh, that would lead to having increased aldosterone. So I'm going to put that down, and that's no matter which of these activities you get. Now, if the blockade is here, we can still root down for cortisol. And so in that case, for 1720 lyase deficiency, cortisol is normal. And we'll just put an or here to tell you something or normal in 1720 lyase deficiency. Now with 17 hydroxylase deficiency, we're gonna get a block so we can't go to cortisol, and so it's gonna be low. So either low if that enzyme's deficient, normal that one is deficient. And how about testosterone? What do you think? I bet you can guess it. Indeed, so in either case, we have a blockade from going to the right here, from going to testosterone. So testosterone is going to be lower than normal. Now, if testosterone is lower than normal and you had to pick one chromosomal sex, meaning either 46XX or 46XY that had ambiguous genitalia, which one would you guess? And we've got a hint right there from our previous disorder that we talked about. Indeed, these are going to be chromosomal males, 46XYs, not enough testosterone. You're going to get ambiguous genitalia with them. 
And I forgot to mention, but you can probably guess too much aldosterone, we're going to have uh, too much mineralocorticoid activity, uh, mineralocorticoid activity, activity, sorry, <laughs> and we're going to get hypokalemia and hypertension as a result of that. For cortisol, kind of depends. If there's too little, then we're going to get failure to mobilize sugar in times of stress. Next disorder is lipoid CAH. What is that? So that's a deficiency of something called star protein, and star protein fits right there. STAR stands for steroidogenic acute regulatory protein. We abbreviate it STAR. And in this case, we have a failure to make cholesterol into pregnenolone. So this whole pathway never gets started the way that it should. And you can probably guess, I'm just gonna tell you real quick, across the board, low hormones. Not making enough aldosterone, not making enough cortisol, not making enough testosterone, because we don't even get started from cholesterol very well. In this case, with testosterone being low, the most affected gender is going to be the 46XYs who get under-viralized or have uh, fully female external genitalia. For the 46XXs, we don't have testosterone, and those individuals can be uh, sexually infantile, meaning that they're normal at birth but fail to go through uh, puberty normally. And I think the reason for that is that testosterone can get converted uh, to some extent to estradiol, and therefore you actually have a failure uh, in the female hormones to fully develop female genitalia as well. Um, and indeed with low aldosterone and low cortisol, it'll be just like our quintessential CAH, 21 hydroxylase deficiency, and then we get salt wasting and adrenal crises. So the final disorder is something called POR deficiency. So what is POR? So it's not uh, specifically on here in one place, but it is an enzyme that POR stands for P450 oxidoreductase. If P450 oxidoreductase is deficient, what you can't do is the normal function of POR, which is to reduce P450 enzymes. Pretty much everything that I just mentioned is a P450 enzyme, so they don't function. So you end up getting a combined enzyme deficiency. I think based on the mutation, uh, or perhaps factors that we don't understand, what the result in terms of aldosterone, cortisol, and testosterone is, is actually variable. And here we can have ambiguous genitalia in either chromosomal females or males, depending on what happens to these hormones. And not only are the steroid hormones affected, but some things in the sterol synthesis pathway like making cholesterol, are also P450 enzymes. So you can have a failure in sterol synthesis as well, leading to some additional phenotypes. For example, bone abnormalities, um, including craniosynostosis. You can get hydrocephalus, dysmorphic facies, uh, renal abnormalities, cognitive problems, and coanal atresia or co coanal uh, stenosis, which would be different about POR deficiency compared to all these other types of CAH. So let's quickly go through some of these concepts now that we've done the disorders. Newborn screen. I mentioned it previously as a way to identify 21 hydroxylase deficiency shortly after birth, which we want to do not so much for the ambiguous genitalia possibility, but because of salt wasting crises, we want to avoid them before they even happen. The metabolite that was measured in that case, do you remember what that was? So it was 17 hydroxy progesterone. Now some of these disorders like 21 hydroxylase deficiency and 11 beta hydroxylase deficiency, you have a blockade downstream, so indeed you'd have a higher concentration. But that's not true for everything. So some things you would miss on the newborn screen. Imagine that you have an individual maybe has what looks like um, an adrenal crisis, has ambiguous genitalia, and you just want to check if any of these disorders is present. The thing you do, I've abbreviated here, MS, is mass spec. You can do urinary mass spec, which detects these various compounds. And given what the intermediates look like, or even the end products, using logic like in this chart, you could figure out which disorder you think it is if it's one of the congenital adrenal hyperplasias. Next thing, inheritance pattern. These are all autosomal recessive. You would get a hint of that in that they're all enzyme deficiencies. Most enzyme deficiencies uh, occur in an autosomal recessive fashion, not true across the board. There's some X-linked, there are even some dominant ones, but for these, all autosomal recessive. SIP, what's that stand for? So that's that cytochrome P450 I'd mentioned. It's in the gene name for a couple of these, 
That's what most of these or all of these enzymes are. Um, so keep that in mind should you uncover it in your reading. What's the RAAS? This may seem uh, familiar from like a physiology class. This is the renin uh, angiotensin aldosterone system, which is a way to increase the blood pressure. And keep in mind that aldosterone is a component of that. And I just brought this up to remind you of what happens when aldosterone is working normally. So aldosterone normally, we're going to resorb sodium and we're going to excrete potassium. So if you have too much aldosterone, you end up with really increased sodium and really decreased potassium beyond what you would normally expect. So in the cases here, like for example, 17 alpha hydroxylase deficiency, too much aldosterone, that's the profile that you get. Now in the case that aldosterone is deficient, like in these including 21 hydroxylase deficiency, that's when you get salt wasting, so you get the opposite. You don't retain sodium and you get hyperkalemia, too much potassium because you're not dumping it off. Final concept, hyperpigmentation. That is a feature of some of these disorders. And the reason why is that you might remember ACTH is high if cortisol is not made. You don't get the feedback, so we keep pumping out ACTH. How do we get ACTH? Well, we start with POMC or pro-opiomelanocortin, which is turned into ACTH, plus something called MSH, melanocyte stimulating hormone. So if you're pumping out too much ACTH, you're probably pumping out too much melanocyte stimulating hormone, meaning that an individual could get hyperpigmented. All right, so let's quickly go through a differential diagnosis. For um, ambiguous or genitalia or sex reversal, it's an extensive differential, and I encourage you, if you're curious, go to a chapter about that. Just very briefly, if the person is 46XX karyotypically, then you're talking about 46XX disorders of sexual uh, development. If the person's 46XY and the genitals look um, ambiguous, you're talking about the 46XY disorders of sexual development. So we'll abbreviate that as DSDs. Some additional things to think about for the 46XX individual who uh, develops normally until puberty and then there's a failure um, to have menses or conceive. One thing on the differential that wouldn't be non-classical CAH uh, would be PCOS. That looks a lot like non-classical CAH. And then for 46XY, we can think about um, something like P450SCC deficiency, which is a deficiency of another protein um, that looks exactly like CAH, with the exception that um, there's no adrenal hyperplasia, and therefore it's not in the congenital adrenal hyperplasia category specifically. You can also think about precocious puberty in this case. Finally, differential for adrenal insufficiency is also a very long differential. Genetically, you could have a problem in cholesterol metabolism, you could have a problem with a CRH receptor or signaling, problem with sterile secretion as well, but I also encourage you to look to a chapter for that if that's a feature in your patient. For references, I looked at similar ones to part one. Gene Reviews is great and has specific chapters for a couple of these. There's a textbook called Clinical Genomics edited by Michael Murray, and then OMIM has entries for all these things as well. I'm so glad that you were able to watch. I appreciate your attention. As always, I appreciate any comments that you have, any questions. You can do that either by uh, writing a little note on YouTube, or you can email me at quickmedicalgenetics at gmail.com. Additionally, I'm always looking for people to contribute for more videos. Um, so if you're interested in doing that, please let me know. Thanks again.